letting folks trickle in here, get connected, and give a moment for that before I jump into things. Thanks everybody so for fun. joining. It's so fun to see all these familiar names. Um, I it's, know. All, it's not quite like seeing everyone in person, but it's nice to see the names on the screen. And I think that is a perfect segue to actually kick this thing off. It's, uh, it's a minute after here. So for the sake of punctuality, let's, uh, let's get right to it. So again, thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, those of you who may not know me, I am Marshall Thompson with Signet. Uh, they call me the director of client solutions here, but what that really means is that I get to work with uh, some of our best partners and friends across the industry, representing a very wide uh, range of programs and industries that they represent. And if you haven't joined an up-level event before, um, it, this is a, an event that we used to host in person uh, at Signet HQ and other venues uh, uh, around the world. Um, but we're, we've been forced to, to make this a, a, a virtual event for the time being. It's uh, been a year since we actually launched this virtual series. And uh, I think we're encountering some similarities to what, what everybody is seeing in the briefing space as far as uh, ability to uh, extend your reach a little bit, uh, increase the frequency, which is exciting. Um, and I, you know, it's a great opportunity to get more folks involved in the conversation. And really what we're trying to do here is provide a forum for a casual industry conversation to uh, give different programs and folks a, an opportunity to, to explore what's going on, to probe their peers a little bit, and uh, you know just have a have a community discussion. So I always try to bring in a, a wide uh, range of programs uh, to these quarterly events. I'm really excited about the the, the panelists that we have here today. Um, in addition to our panelists, I I, I just want to call out who we have uh, in the audience. We, we have a great group of folks in the audience. Um, I'm hoping many of you can actually be presenters for us at some point in the future here on the panel. Um, many of you already have. So just wanted to, to kind of take a moment to recognize uh, all of the, all the brands we have represented here. It really just goes to show how committed this community is to pushing the envelope, to constantly improving their game uh, and really up-leveling what we're all about together moving forward in unison. So without further ado, I want to I want to get right into it and uh, and introduce uh, my panelists today. I, I want to start with uh, with my neighbor here in Silicon Valley. Uh, Andy, how are you today? I'm great, Marshall. How are you doing? I, I'm doing okay. You know, I'm uh, stoked to be back for another one of these. So uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, the uh, what what's going on at NetApp these days, uh, what, what you guys do there, maybe to start with? Sure. Well, thanks, Marshall. I'm delighted to join my colleagues here as part of this conversation. Um, NetApp's a cloud-led data-centric software company. We, we manage data for most of the, the world's largest enterprises. Um, I've been with the company for almost four years, first as a briefing manager, and now leading a great team based out of our headquarters or actually really our homes here in, in Silicon Valley. Um, before that, I had the opportunity to, to stand up and to lead customer engagement teams uh, at other companies in, in different industries. Um, at NetApp, we're a global program. Um, we have teams on the East Coast. We have teams in Europe. We have folks in India. And, and that global diversity um, gives us all the advantages of a really diverse team but also all the challenges of an even more diverse internal and external customer base. So every day is an adventure in that regard. No doubt about that. Well, we're excited to have you in the conversation today, Andy. Thanks for, thanks for making some time. So moving along here, um, I, you, Andy, you represent this massive global organization, pretty well recognized in the community, uh, awards and whatnot. Uh, Paula, in Texas, uh, Rackspace, you're maybe uh, not quite the same level, but things have been uh, pretty wild and wonderful this year at, uh, at Rackspace. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, a little bit about what's happened at Rackspace? Yeah, Marshall, first of all, thanks for having me here. I'm excited to be a part of this conversation today. 
Um, I've been at Rackspace for going on eight years, which is crazy. And I will say it's always wild at Rackspace, but the last year certainly was extra wild. Um, but Rackspace technology, for those of you who don't know, is a multi-cloud solutions provider. So we support our customers on a variety of technologies, including our own data centers, as well as AWS, Microsoft, and Google's data centers, and then we provide application development and a, a whole slew of other things. Um, we are a global company, but our program is only um, based out of our headquarters, or as Andy says, our homes in San Antonio, Texas. And um, even though we do see some global briefings, it's predominantly North America that we manage. Um, but we've started having those conversations about what it would look like to do these globally, especially now that we know that we can do these virtually. So that's a, a challenge we've been exploring and figuring out what that's going to look like for us in the future. Fantastic. So I, I want to ask, I, what do you actually call your program at Rackbase? We call it the Customer Success Center. Um, and our culture as a company has always been very customer centric. We call it fanatical experience. And so at the center of each of our briefings is what the customer success is, what their objectives are. So that's how we came to that name. I, I really like it. I mean, it really stays true to your kind of SaaS nature, your uh, your, your modern roots at Rackspace. So I think it's great. Um, Customer success is big for us at Signet. I think we're going to start seeing that term more and more across uh, the tech space in general. Andy, I, I missed you there. I, I think it's interesting enough. We, I want to touch on it. What, what do you call your uh, your flagship center here in, in the Bay? Um, we actually, it's the Data Visionaries Center because we like to think of our customers um, as as visionaries, as data visionaries. And so, where else would they come to to learn more about that than a center named after them? So true. Well, and that that uh, nicely transitions us to Corinne in Chicago. Hey, Corinne, what's up? Hey there. I'm so glad you're here today. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, and similarly to both of our other panelists here, but uh, we've been seeing a lot uh, from the head in the tech news, some, some big aggressive moves over the last year. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, a quick bit about Ahead and maybe how you guys make money. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be on uh, this uh, panel with uh, such esteemed colleagues. Um, so my name is Corinne Connolly Cabreras. I'm Ahead's Briefing Program Manager. Uh, I've been with Ahead for uh, a little over seven years, uh, back when we were a little boutique for firm and uh, maybe 100 employees. Now uh, we are barreling towards 1,500 uh, around that uh, and continuing to grow. Uh, IT, it is an IT consulting firm and um, we're really aimed at helping our clients in various industries, uh, energy, education, healthcare, is a, is a huge one for us, so you name it. Uh, we provide a portfolio of uh, services uh, for them uh, aimed at really reaching their digital business initiatives. So whether that's in uh, data center infrastructure, cloud infrastructure, modernizing their applications, integrating security into their environment, um, including monitoring into their environment. Um, we help with um, any managed services packages, education and enablement, and um, yeah, just a, a plethora of services aimed at their digital transformation needs. <laughs> a, a plethora indeed. So oh, as and, far as- And I apologize, I didn't answer the second part. Um, AHEAD's briefing program is uh, centered in Chicago, um, and it's it's currently just me um, kind of supporting, um, and we're trying to uh, rationalize our what our central hubs look like um, for for briefing program needs. So and, sorry about that. You are no, you're great. Uh, sticking with the the briefing name, then for now, you kind of streamline that so you're the ahead briefing program, right? Yep. Yeah, very simplistic it. in nature. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. And then we got fired for calling it what it is. All right. So I got a quick poll that I want to just flash up here for the audience. Um, I, this is a question that we're all thinking about these days, of course. But uh, 
uh, no need for accuracy here. Just uh, best guess is what I'm curious about. Trying to get a sense from the from the community what's going on. We've got a lot of different regions represented here, so um, curious what what becomes of all this. So moving right along here, uh, I want to get into it. Um, so as far as uh, up levels in the past, we've had very kind of targeted themes. Uh, you know, virtual briefing, measurement, things like that. Really. It, where we're at right now feels like a very transitional moment. Um, we, we've exited this year with the 2020 label, which comes with a lot of baggage, obviously. Um, I, I've just felt a, a different vibe out there, if you'll allow me the, the word. Uh, it just seems like people are feeling a little bit more optimistic, a, a little bit more free to look ahead and think about what's coming next, whatever it might be. I mean, that's going to be different across every organization. but. I just want to hear a little bit about from you guys in this kind of up level unplugged format, if you will. Talk to me about some things that you're observing uh, across the industry or within your own program that may be expected or unexpected. Maybe, Andy, uh, let's start with you here. Sure. Um, I think we're seeing two different things, and, and I'll be curious if, if these comport with other folks um, in the audience on the panel here think. One is is Zoom fatigue, and that's I think I've read more articles in the journal about that in the last couple months than than anything else. It feels like people are getting tired of being on camera for both internal and external meetings. Um, back when it was novel, I don't think everyone realized how much energy it takes to 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 do this, and so we see. You know, while we're not seeing a drop off in customers coming to see us, we're seeing a drop off in customers we can actually see. Um, and that is, that is unfortunate. And we're trying to figure out ways to, to keep it more engaging and exciting. And, and the second thing, and this maybe goes along with this, I think folks are treating all virtual engagements a little more casually. So the way that's manifested for us is a lot of reschedules. Um, you know, people put someone on the calendar and then they want to change and they want to add someone else in. Sometimes it's for a good reason where it's because they want more folks to come into the um, conversation and, you know, make it more available, this whole flat earth thing we have now. Um, but, but in general, it makes it a little more challenging and it's hard to be efficient when you have to rework things constantly to, to meet those changing asks from customers. Yes, I think it's so true, Andy. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff to unpack there. I want, I want to give the others on the panel a chance to, to weigh in. Uh, Karen, let's, uh, let's hear about kind of what, what's caught your attention lately, um, things that you may not have uh, anticipated. What, what's uh, notable to you? Yeah, definitely. I think in the in the same breath as what Andy just said, uh, we have started to see of late uh, just a, a, a lack in um, process following. Um, they uh, a lot of our discussion leaders um, will kind of drop off video too, which is you know even though we try to and you know strongly advise that you have to be on on video. Um, you know, people are are starting to um, yeah, and we and I even say that in 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 a emails that I send out to clients, uh, we'll have a lot of people just be uh, off video um, even when they're presenting. So that has been um, a, a decline that I that I didn't see coming, um, but I think it is speaking to the, the fact that um, in the virtual realm, a lot of our discussion leaders are on back to back client events. So um, maybe in their own minds, they're prioritizing what events that they need to be on camera for. Um, an expected trend, um, as I think we all uh, are kind of shifting our needs is the need to prioritize the uh, what that the standardization looks like for uh, in person um, briefing experiences. So um, I have I have had an ongoing battle with um, you know reprioritizing what a briefing playbook looks like. So that has been kind of shifted back to end of you know end of the year, and now it's kind of um, back to the forefront. So we we really need to uh, focus on standardization, not just in the the methods of engagement for for briefings, but uh, in in what these hybrid briefings are going to look like. So that has been a a trend that we are um, that's part of the conversations right now. I like it. Okay. 
Sala, that leaves you. Talk to me. Talk to me about what you're seeing. Uh, challenges, maybe opportunities, if you see any out there. What what uh, what are you excited about? Yeah. So I think it, as as Corinne and Andy were talking, we've actually seen we have seen a decline in volume of briefings in Q1 that I didn't expect because we had such a strong year oh. last year, considering everything that happened. And just as we've been talking right now, I thought about what the trend we saw when the pandemic first started and everything shifted, we saw a decline in briefings then too, because I think some people were saying, let's just wait and see what happens. Maybe we'll meet in person in three months. And I think now they're in that stage again, thinking let's wait and see where we are in three months. Maybe we can meet in person. And I, I, I just thought that, but we've started hearing like sales rockers coming to us and saying, when do you think we can bring customers to the office? So I think there might be this like paralysis of waiting to see what, like they're testing the water. So that's that's a challenge because we need we we want we want our rockers, which is what we call our employees, to use the space, and we want customers to continue to engage with us in briefings, even though we are seeing some of the same trends in terms of Zoom fatigue on both ends, the customer end and our end. Um, and in terms of opportunities, I think I'm excited to see what this industry does. I think it was really amazing to me to see how we pivoted in so many ways. And I know not all programs were able to do it, but if you had asked me at the beginning of last year, could your job be virtual? I would have said no, probably not, but it has been now for over 12 months. So we proved that wrong. Definitely. It's, it's been really interesting to watch the industry adapt across the board. Uh, so Andy, I want to I go back to something that you mentioned in some of our, our discussions previously related to, to hybrid. Um, it's something that we're all kind of tossing this idea around right now. You have the unique perspective of actually having kids that are in the, the right grade school age that they're actually experiencing some of this hybrid model. Is, that, is there anything we can take away from what you've observed there uh, that may apply to our world? Uh, I think so, I think so. So, so last year, everything was 100% virtual. It seemed like hybrid was gonna be this nirvana. Oh, we could serve everybody. We can serve both remote and in person and, and maybe even make things more impactful. And now, you know, as the world's beginning to open up, we got to figure out what that is. And I got to tell you, the only industry that, as you said, that, that's doing this at scale is K to 12 education. And, and I've got a couple middle schoolers. Um, and I can tell you, at least as it's been done so far, hybrid stinks. Um, there's, there's three segments. There's, three, you know, again, this is so far, I'm going to say so far, I yeah. don't want everyone to go, ah, it's the end of the world. Three segments you got to deal with here. And it's been lousy for all three. So the first are the kids who actually can go to campus. Um, they're sitting in a classroom with a small group and they're only getting half an experience because the teacher has to teach to a camera and also to the kids around the room. And so, and sometimes repeat things, do things differently. Now, the kids who are on camera, who are remote, um, they, they not only are also getting half, but even less because they're missing that in, in, in classroom sides. I don't mean no passing. I mean, just like the, the discussion that happens, that's where the magic of, of education. And the third group are the teachers and Lord help them. They have to focus between two different audiences and they're expected to do equally well for both. I, I got to think that a lot have parents climbing all over them you know, if they don't feel like their kid is getting the same kind of education. Um, my, my hypothesis is that hybrid is a lot like multitasking. There's really no such thing as doing two things at the same time. It's just rapid, but inefficient switching between things. And so, you know, as we think about as an industry, what we're gonna do for hybrid, I think it's more than just leaning into technology. It's really acknowledging that, that you're trying to do things, you're trying to do two things. And, and figuring out how you're going to focus or how you're gonna split the difference and, and owning up to the fact that you can't be perfect for two audiences at the same time. It's refreshing to hear you say it out loud, Andy. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that there's a, a right tool for every job and uh, multitasking, as you say, kind of diluting that model to try to, to have one uniform approach for every type of engagement maybe isn't the right answer going ahead. So, be curious to see how 
things shake out, uh, there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of potential for for a different approach. So we'll see. But I think you know, if I were to think about in uh, the great part about my role is that I have the opportunity to talk to all these different programs. You know, that we're talking ten plus logos a week, right? And so I get to hear all these unique challenges based on their segment or where they are in the world, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, a few things that really caught my attention are in terms of opportunity. Uh, you know, we've all had to adapt to this new model. Um, unfortunately, there are programs out there that without a physical space to uh, administrate, they really have been left with not, uh, you know, they don't know where their value is in the executive briefing case. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, I've seen programs totally adapt and create new use cases for them to add value within the business. Um, so that's becoming kind of part of a, a content creation machine, like relying on many of their same demos and subject matter experts that they were already leveraging and actually creating assets that can be part of kind of an on-demand briefing program or you know whatever you want to call it, but really uh, making those assets accessible to the rest of the enterprise and adding value in new ways and to new business units that they may not have ever even collaborated with previously. Um, another one is just this need for management of the, the increase in velocity. So uh, as everybody on the panel mentioned, because everything is digital, we don't have travel schedules. It's easier to join a Zoom call. Um, you know, We don't have to iron our slacks or whatever it was we were doing. We can go faster, but are we hurting the quality of the experience? Are we not doing our kind of brands justice by supporting these kind of rougher, uh, less polished engagements? And I think that there's some an answer in the middle where we can apply the right type of engagement uh, and really get the results that we're looking for. And another, you all mentioned this, but really just finding unique and compelling, memorable ways to differentiate if you're offering a virtual solution to make that well above and beyond whatever sales is doing. And that can be done with elbow grease, you know, just putting a little extra polish into presentation and personalization of content or creating, like we've seen from, uh, you know, larger programs, creating these whole virtual environments. And I think that you know, we'll, we'll see an answer somewhere in the middle of a lot of that. You know, we don't want to overshoot this need for, digital experiences if we're if we're finding that uh, a move to in person is what our users are actually asking for. So be curious to see, but that, that's all great stuff, guys. So you get me excited every time we talk. I want to I want to keep moving here to our, to our next topic, um, which is in terms of tiers. So uh, have you identified, have you defined additional tiers, different service levels for your programs offering uh, to accommodate new types of engagement that you may not have previously? Uh, Corinne, maybe I'll start with you here. Uh, talking about different new types of briefings or uh, different levels of briefings. How are you thinking about that? Yeah, excellent. Um, so just some background. Uh, 2020 was a year of instrumental growth at a head. We went, I, yeah. I mentioned that, um, you know, we went from at the beginning of 2020 about, um, you know, 600 employees, which we were adjusting to virtually, um, to, you know, now we're almost 1500. And with that, I think we have had to merge um, the processes of uh, essentially three different programs in Q4 of last year. So we are, tiered briefings was uh, an idea that through AVPM when I joined it in uh, 2018, I was like, this is what, I, this is lovely. I need to do it, but I didn't really have the business stakeholder um, involvement or interest. Um, so I think we are now at a, a very interesting point in our company growth where we can once again revisit the need for tiering our briefings and um, having different requirements of our sales teams. Um, now that you know, I'm, I'm supporting about 150 sales team members. Uh, we need to be able to qualify at what point you should be having a briefing and not a meeting <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and where we can apply the right appropriate um, amount of resources from the briefing program, but also from our discussion leaders. Um, and, you know, that's not to say we don't want to say no to our sales um, members at any point. We just want it to be a give and take where if they 
give us the right appropriate amount of client information, we can then map the most appropriate um, interaction for them. So we are currently, my um, manager and I are currently in the process of validating what that looks like and then also um, reviewing it with our key stakeholders. And we're also in the, in the process of doing that, we are um, in, in currently socializing the idea of creating a briefing committee, uh, advisory board of sorts. So that is probably going to be one of the key things that we run by them. And then we can kind of use them as speakerphones across the organization to re-educate our um, the new face of our sales, uh, our sales force to the right engagement at the right time with the right resources to fit your clients needs so <laughs> exciting well said Karen. all right so Paula, how are you thinking about this have you identified maybe additional service levels that you'd like to bring to the table or kind of refining your definition of what you already had um talk to me about how you see the direct day yeah so something that was really interesting about uh, or a, an interesting shift we made during the the pandemic work from home um, situation we've been in is that we went from not facilitating any briefings to facilitating all of them. And that is like a top tier experience that we were not providing at our in-person engagements because of volume. We just couldn't handle it with the size of my team. And so with the decrease in volume virtually, we were able to start doing that. And now we're asking ourselves, how do we re-enter the in-person volume? We can't pull out facilitation entirely. So we've started thinking through a tiering system as well, where we would tier the top, um, or we would facilitate the top tier and maybe not the others. But my leader is of the opinion that facilitation is so valuable that I think what we'll end up having to do is build a business case and say, in order to support this volume, we need additional headcount to be able to do that. So that's an exciting thing to think about. Um, and so we've talked about this before too. We, um, but we truly do believe that anybody who comes to the briefing center should have the best experience. That's just part of how Rackspace does things. And so we feel weird about tiering that experience to a certain level. Um, there are, we've started talking about, um, they would be tiered for our purposes in terms of how much attention they get, but overall um, the experience to the end user would be the same, especially to the customer. Um, and then one other thing we've added that was new over the last year is we've added in multi-customer briefings, which is not something we did before, but that's been proving to be a really effective way um, and a different way to interact with our customers in, a, in an intimate setting, but um, just a really different um, format than what we were used to. So that's something we're still playing around with. We are building that that plan. Um, I do have a new member of my team that's owning that and we are planning on doing 20 this year. So we'll see. <laughs> I love that. That's something I'm really excited about that kind of multi customer forum sort of thing. I mean, it's, it's kind of akin to what we're doing here today where, you know, my customers don't just want to hear me talk, unfortunately, uh, but providing an opportunity for them to actually engage with one another and hear what they have to say is a great deal more valuable um, and if i can still be you know, part of facilitating that conversation i'm adding value but um, really providing a, an opportunity for that conversation to actually take place so it's an interesting thing and you're not the only one saying that i feel like that across the industry there's rumblings of this multi-customer support a lot of questions about how but i think just the, the idea of why is really exciting to me so Andy, I know that you're you're always thinking about these things through an interesting lens, uh, kind of through your your business hat. Um, talk to me about different levels or types of engagements uh, that you support at NetApp. Maybe uh, what you're looking to do in the future. Um, yeah, what's going on? Sure. Well, well, first of all, I I do love hearing you talk. So don't sell yourself short there, dude. Um, so so we our program we facilitated most everything for about the last I think it's about the last six years or so since I, I joined the first time back then um, and going, and then we've had some tiers that were driven largely by the sales team and kind of how engaged they were, what they, what they needed, what they told us they needed. Um, as, we, as we pivoted to this all virtual world, we, we had the bandwidth to, to again, facilitate everything because a lot of the ones that were what we called hosted 
you know, where it was, it was just, we'd provide the logistics for it. Those, they didn't need a virtual briefing for those. Those could be run by the, the, um, the folks in the field. Now, um, and some of this is, some of this is plans that are just taking shape and scaling, but, but to build on what Corinne said, it's about having the right kind of engagement for the right audience. So we've been doing some things. Um, my colleague over on the East Coast has built out an amazing program to do um, stuff at scale, uh, multi-customer workshops. We are doing some things that are more, instead of one to many, that's one to many, we're doing some almost many to one where we're doing, um, helping with facilitate research programs, advisory board-like activities. And in the same token, you know, our, our team is still doing the facilitated briefings and we're just trying to find ways to do more with that, more research up front to, to find ways that we're adding value and not just adding volume to the, to the conversation, adding words to it. Very interesting. So it, for, I'm just gonna put this out to the group. So for any of you that are currently offer or are beginning to offer a kind of multi-tiered service level for different types of opportunities, what are some key data points that you look at for making that determination? Paula, I know that you think about this a lot. Um, maybe you don't have a policy in place, but what are kind of the first things that you would evaluate for an inbound request for some kind of engagement um, as part of like a traditional sales opportunity? Are you looking at the value or uh, what, what do you look to, to to kind of assess? Yeah, that, that's the tricky part because we have such a wide uh, variety of solutions that we provide our customers. Each, each um, bucket of solutions has different criteria on what a strategic account might look like. But as we've had these discussion, discussions, it typically is associated to a couple of things. One would be the size of the opportunity. Um, two would be if they're an existing customer, their their current spend with Rackspace as well as their temperature. So they might not spend a lot, but if they're at risk of leaving, we are going to facilitate that briefing. Um, or if they um, are what we consider a strategic account. So we have some large logos that spend very little with us, but we see high potential for growth within a, that account, then we would we would consider that a top tier uh, as we've sort of started mapping this out. Very interesting. Hey, so you're a customer success center. Is there an opportunity for both sales organizations and potentially like customer success teams to initiate a briefing request for a given account? Yes. Interesting. We actually, I would say this isn't our ideal breakdown, but probably close to 70% of our briefings are with install based customers. So existing customer base that have growth opportunities on the table. So we do see some net new acquisition, but the, the vast majority of them are existing customers. Well, that, that kind of checks out, right? The charter of your CF team is to guarantee that level of satisfaction. We all know our, uh, our sales guys can be a little coin operated. And if the, the deal value isn't there, you may never see it right. across your desk. Interesting. Corinne, Andy, are there other kind of business units that are bringing you uh, these engagements uh, you know, that are in, a, in a meaningful way, like customer success is for the Rackspace program? I know for, uh, for a head, um, our business unit, such as our security practice, our cloud practice um, data center, they have, I'm, and I'm not tapped into this um, a ton, but I know that they have specific financial goals on a quarterly basis. So they are actually looking, you know, for um, that they help the sales teams in identifying the white spaces and opportunities for their specific practices, as we call them, to um, to, to, to both enhance the, the clients that we are, our current clients, but then also kind of um, farm for additional um, potential clients. So I know that they are also a, a little bit coin operated, um, but really that's just kind of I think, tied intrinsically to how they can scale their teams um, appropriately. So they work very hand in hand and I get, um, 
I get a lot of pings from um, members of these specific practices where they are actually the ones leading the charge for some, or they're the main um, contact for a lot of these these cu uh, customers, which is has been a, a change I'd say in the last two years or so. Excellent. Andy, have you shifted to accommodate maybe new uh, pipelines for requests coming through your program? A little bit. Um, you know, the vast, vast majority come through account teams. More and more we're seeing folks that are, um, that are our channel partners that, that want to do it. And they're often still working hand in hand with an internal NetApp person, but we're finding more and more are driven by them. They're the ones bringing bringing the, the deeper customer relationships and really more customer insight, you know, and, and thinking to the, the first question you asked Marshall about how you're approaching it. I, I would say that, that our tiering informally um, is we will provide a level of engagement, a level of I don't call it service. We could give service to everybody, but, but when an account team comes to us and really wants to collaborate, and has great insight, has done research on the customer, has thought about strategy, knows they want to do, knows what they want to do. That's when we can provide the best value because then we have something to work with. Um, we can. It's it's basically we they get back what they give. You know, if they if if folks right. come and they just said here's a customer, give them these three topics. We'll try and up level it a little bit to use the word of the day. Um, but for the most part, the best opportunity is when when they come to us and say, hey, here's what I want to accomplish. How can we do this together? And we love those. No doubt, it certainly makes it more fun, right? And I think this concept in general, when I think about the programs that I talk to that may be struggling, I mean, you, let's speak frankly here, you all represent highly engaged programs within your respective businesses, um, you know, you're all massive growth companies, uh, especially Corinne and Paula, Andy, you're already kind of a big player in the space. Um, so, but these other organizations that are looking, you know, hey, sales is bypassing me. I can't get the request that we once did because we don't have our you know, uh, granite countertops and mahogany to offer as an environment. We, if you're not getting it from the sales org, you've got to find new ways to engage internal audiences that are going to see the value of what you do. And I mean, these are the conversations that there can't be put into this small little box of what we think of as the briefing program. Like you're telling the story of the brand and communicating in a way that's going to be compelling for not just customers, but partners across the space. Uh, it's uh, so valuable to what you do. And I think uh, all of you kind of have the, you're activated and you can actually go and run with this. But I think using you as an inspiration to activate other business units and to find ways to bring your services to other types of users creates an interesting potential during this kind of awkward transitional time that we all find ourselves in. So let's see, I may have had some, some thoughts there to kind of summarize. I think you guys nailed it perfectly. I have nothing else to add here, but essentially more levels of service, you know, different tools in your toolkit mean that you can interact with different types of users, as I just said, more opportunities to, to influence uh, the business uh, to stand out really. And, uh, you know, standardization, as you spoke to, Corinne, gives us a, a little bit more quantifiable criteria to make those decisions based on. Uh, so I think, Starting with that is something that I'm hearing programs focusing on is really what are those levers and knobs we have to make better decisions about how we approach a given request or opportunity that's coming across our desk. So with that said, I want to get to, to some of the fun stuff looking ahead. So we've talked about challenges here. We've talked about how we've adjusted and adapted and uh, really we're in this world, uh, I, most of you that know me, I, I'm an avid cyclist. There's a, a company here in the Bay Area called Specialized, and their their motto for the last decade or so has been "Innovate or Die," um, which I think is very true in the inter enterprise space we all operate in. So, where are we all investing, uh, either time or actual dollars? Think of this as maybe first dollar spent. Whether it actually exists or not yet, uh, I'm curious about where we're thinking about, about putting our time and resources back into the program to set ourselves up for success 
looking ahead into this brave new future that we're all presented at with. Um, so Karen, maybe I'll, I'll start with you. Um, you're the, the smallest program of the bunch. Um, that probably will directly translate to, to maybe dollars funding. So maybe tell me about where you're thinking of, uh, of focusing your, your time and energy. Yeah, definitely. So while we've been able to uh, cut back on some of our budget spends that kind of transferred over from 2019 to 2020 and expanded with all of the exponential growth. Um, so we've saved in areas such as hotel spends and catering and whatnot. Um, I'm trying to get a little bit more creative in like where we allocate the, those investments. So I think, uh, you know, areas such as, you know, a dis discussion leader bureau has been on the um, forefront, but um, I think that we are trying to get our, our, our house in order first and foremost. So while we eventually do want to invest in, in training for our uh, discussion leaders, um, utilizing such uh, amazing offerings such as from Mendel Communications, who I see on the line. So hi guys. Um, we also want to invest in, um, you know, rationalizing what our in-person events will will look like so Marshall as you know you know we've had conversations about how do we get you know uh, our Chicago uh, area you know up and running to be the skeleton for the framework for the rest of uh, what we validate our, our other central hub so you know areas to uh, standardize our content um, because we do have a um, a branding um, uh, issue focus right now. Um, we are coming together as one brand, so that's huge. Um, and then another area is I think uh, we really want to uh, uncover and validate some new tools to uh, up level the experience for the virtual realm as well as the the in person. So we don't. I know that we've kind of mentioned earlier that hybrid kind of stinks right now, um, but we do want to um, be able to not just leave our uh, virtual attendees in the dark. Uh, quite literally, we did have a briefing last week that um, we couldn't even see the the attendees who are in person. Um, and we want to be able to close those gaps and um, discern what tools we can use to improve the technology, both uh, for the virtual uh, attendees, as well as for the ones in person to feel connected to their, their con virtual counterparts. I like it. Well, you, you have a pretty uh, serious challenge. It seems like every time you would start making those plans of where your <laughs> first, next, next step is, you've uh, acquired another company and another uh, location along with it. So your <laughs> scope keeps changing, but you're doing a great job managing it all and making it look easy. Um, so kudos to you. I, I didn't announce this uh, at the outset, but just launched another poll. Same question for the audience. Basically, I've done my best to group this into kind of logical categories. If you just give us your uh, best guess or just whatever you're feeling at the moment, uh, that'll do for me. Just kind of curious where the, uh, the sentiment is out there. So thanks for participating, y'all. Um, all right. So let's see here. Andy, what, what are you thinking about as far as opportunities to take the program to the next level or maybe shore up some things that we identified in 2020 as gaps? Uh, where are you thinking your, your time and, uh, and theoretically dollars are, are best spent? Well, you know, being a larger program and having a lot of people, there's about 15 or 16 folks, you know, globally on the team, um, we have the opportunity actually to, to make a lot of little bets instead of just going to one place. But if there was one major focus, I'd say it's we're, we're going to try to build on and we are building on our team strength. And that's that's the team. That's the people. Um, you know, we've been facilitating for so long that we can take that strength and use it other places around the organization, support other teams, um, basically applying that skill to new needs. We're doing things like delivering design thinking workshops, facilitating research sessions, you know, and trying to evolve CX based on the needs of each audience. And, and doing that has not just kept us relevant, I think it's helped us grow our impact within the company. But in terms of, in terms of where investments are going, leveraging that, there's really four four things. The first is scale, and that's the one-to-many, the multi-customer workshops um, that we're doing and target different segments. The second thing is measurement, um, understanding how to tie what we do 
to business results. So, so we can not just to prove our value, but also to understand, you know, what it is that works and, and frankly, what doesn't. Um, third thing is in, in feedback, we're trying to, like everybody else out there, trying to find new ways to, to gather it. Um, we're even looking at a tool to gather video testimonials um, from customers to have something a little bit different. And, and finally, as I was alluding to earlier, collaboration, you know, not just with other groups around the company, but even with customers, with channel partners, and that goes to, you know, offering higher level, higher value, more engaging things. Um, and it's, it's something that, that with all the pains of the pandemic, the fact that we can pull resources in um, from our, our global team and, and globally the NetApp team lets us do a lot more in, in any given engagement in that regard. So we're really enjoying the, the benefit of the flat earth as one of my colleagues has talked about it. Indeed, indeed. Okay, so Andy, I'm not going to let you off the hook quite yet. Uh, uh -oh. you, you are a self-described quant guy uh, in one of our previous conversations. I know you're into the numbers. Talk to me about measurement a little more. I just want to double click here. I mean, you've got the, the scale and the team like you talked about. So talk to me about the how a little bit, kind of in if we're, we're thinking about first priorities of where you're trying to measure and how you're trying to measure. What does that look like? Um, so the number one thing is connecting better with our existing company systems, the CRM systems. Um, and I know that everyone's doing this to some degree and we are just getting started, but, but um, we've made some progress. It's, I think it's a, for me that the, the challenge we're trying to crack is the fidelity kind of the, of the data and not just, we talked to someone we influenced, but what did we do? What's the KPI? That, that will predict future results later. Um, you know, is it a certain format, a certain length, a certain person, um, a certain level of engagement? I, still early for us in that because we're just now getting those, those software connections to be able to take data from our briefing tool over here and connect it with business results over here, um, it, which is a different level of, of detail and I think reality than just sort of the more ephemeral, the field saying, hey, we liked it, or this, you know, this one to five scale, how'd it work? That's great. And it, it predicts future engagement, which helps with volumes and all that. But it doesn't really tell you if you're the thing making the difference. And that's, what, that's, the, that's the holy grail, I think, for all of us is, is what's going to make a difference. Yes, it is the holy grail indeed. Anybody that's talked to me, I, Andy, I've probably talked your ear off about this, but yeah, I see the customer program as being this sort of this box, that, which you know, opportunity comes through one side, you do your magic inside of this box, and then on the other, uh, our expected result is an increased velocity of that deal, uh, hopefully closing faster, and potentially increasing the actual value of that opportunity through exposing them to Solutions they may have not been exposed to previously by their account team or whoever it is, but yeah, finding ways to track on that is uh, where we're going to stay close with the NetApp program and see what you guys make of it. But I think thinking of this TRM as this wealth of data that we can not only read from, but write to provides this new context with which we can kind of interact with the greater sales organization. There's a lot of opportunity there. I haven't seen it happening a lot, but better believe it's a big focus of what my teams are up to here at Signet. Uh, it's kind of our part of our daily dialogue right now. So very interesting stuff. Paula, you are doing great stuff here in terms of business data and intelligence. I don't, I, I don't want to miss the chance to hear about what else you might be thinking about as far as your priorities for Q2 and beyond uh, in 2021. What, what are you thinking about uh, Areas for improvement, uh, investment back into your into your team. Um, what's going on? Yeah, so I mean, honestly, just to build a little bit on what Andy said, um, early in 2019, we for the first time ever had a briefing scheduling tool implemented, and that started allowing us to build these business cases for additional investment because. To Andy's point, everybody at Rackspace loved the briefing center. Everyone said, yeah, it works, it closes deals, but it was all anecdotal. 
And when it was time to ask for money, they said, you don't need it. Your program's great. So that was basically our, our eternal struggle. And finally, this allowed us to incorporate briefing data into the overall marketing performance dashboard that is in front of our executive leadership team every week. And so then they could see, okay, we, and, and we can't claim all the fame for successful, um, you know, outcomes for opportunities, but we can say there seems to be a correlation between opportunities that close and those that come through the briefing center. So there's still a ton of work to do there, but the ability to have hard numbers around that has allowed us to now look forward and say, here's where we want to make the program even better. And so into 2021, um, we've launched a speakers bureau and also partnered with Mandel, which we're super excited about. We've been trying to do for years um, and we had our first training. And so we are really excited about that because I think that allows us to invest in our internal stakeholders who we can't run the program without and also ensure that the experience our customers have is the best one it can be because we're putting our best foot forward every time. Um, so that's it. That's a huge win for us. We're also um, hopefully going to uh, get formal facilitation training for my full team. Some of us have gone, gone through it, but not all of us. And that will be a huge um, add to the experience that our customers have in the briefing center as well. Um, and then as everyone's mentioned, we're, we're exploring how we up-level the experience. How is the virtual engagement that they have with Rackspace different than what they have with our competitors? And that involves a lot of things, aside from the training of our speakers and, and the facilitators, the technology that they interact with, because we're a technology company after all. And so if our technology is not good, that doesn't look very good on us. So um, talking with, with you, Marshall, and others to figure out uh, when we, even when we return to the office in person, which hopefully will be sometime this year, um, we anticipate 100% still having customers who only interact with us virtually. And so how do we manage those engagements from the briefing center by bringing in better technology, better tools, et cetera. So those are kind of the three things, the, the metrics, the experience and the, the training that are my priority for this year. I love it. I think that you said something that's very powerful there as far as the way that you're looking at tools to be applicable now to solve for a current challenge, but not kind of overshoot in terms of that use case being too specific to the unique time that we were in for the last year, right? So like not it kind of uh, it's like selling at the, at the bottom, if you will. Um, so I, I think that what I've seen is there's tools like customer facing portals that really differentiate the briefing programs offering from what the sales team does. And something I keep coming back to is, uh, you know, just having that easily tangible uh, value add to the conversation through something that feels slick, professional, high tech, as you've said, uh, is a great way to do that. Then it extends back into the in-person world just the same, right? That investment isn't lost. And again, it can even be a way to unify, the, it, it, should we determine that, that hybrid is the right approach for certain engagements? I think that some, it may be. We gotta unify those audiences. So having a common interface with which your customers and attendees can interact with content that's relevant to that briefing and also to solicit feedback. You've gotta provide this common service. I, I reference this all the time, but programs used to tell me, Marshall, the only way we can get a response to a question is by putting pen and paper in front of them. And if they're in New York City and you're in San Antonio, I don't know how you're going to achieve that. So a digital means seems like the best way forward. And if you can speak to, hey, we have a survey, we have a question that we need you to answer and speak to the same interface for both of those use cases, it's a whole lot less talking and explaining to do. So definitely something that I think is exciting and i think that the yeah the kind of bigger to to provide new solutions from the space created these new use cases which was really exciting to see programs come to us and with new ideas and solutions um, which became products for Sigma. i mean andy you you directly contributed to some things that are kind of key features in some of our virtual products which is really exciting um and it's just the nature of this digital means overall when it doesn't involve a construction project we can get a lot more done. We can go a lot faster. It's funny how that works. So 
just to kind of wrap up a, a couple other thoughts I had here. Back in measurement, I think you guys killed that. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. It's still because is this question mark across the industry, but I see programs like yours actually starting to answer some of these questions that were just a, a black box previously. And finally, something that I it maybe isn't a big emphasis for the, the panel here, but just this higher production media capability. A lot uh, on our poll response, uh, water investing in this higher production value kind of uh, broadcast type capabilities. I think it's an important distinction that we recognize that broadcast is not a dialogue. It is a broadcast. It is one to many, uh, but there still are ways to leverage the talent and the facilities that you have, whether it's the actual site or the tools and tech that you have to contribute, you know, to use those uh, tools to, to kind of contribute to the greater message, but also bring that experience into your briefing to really differentiate it from the standard offering. Um, and I, I know that you're, you're all looking at cool ways to do that. So we're, we're all excited to see it. So I think that really, uh, brings us to the end of my questions for this panel. In our last couple minutes, um, I want to get some kind of closing thoughts from you guys. Uh, and tell me something. Tell me something you're excited about. Looking ahead, um, Andy, you're first. On the spot, um, you know, I'm looking forward to see how we take something that that, as I said earlier, I think kind of kind of sucks and and making it better. Because if you had said to me, I think I'm. Can probably using the same thing Paul said, you know, we could do this thing and we could actually adapt and improve in mid-March and by mid-April be, be kind of running at full speed again to a different direction, but still full speed. I wouldn't have believed it. And we have. So I'm confident we're going to be able to figure out how to navigate reopening, navigate multiple audiences and navigate changing expectations. Um, and I can't wait to see how as a group together, you know, we do that. You know, Andy, I, I think uh, that's such a neat little summary of, of how I'm thinking of it. And I know I've talked to these other two so frequently. I think they would agree with you with the amount of time left. I'm going to call it there. Um, so thank you all for participating here. I don't want to take this up to the last minute. Housekeeping things, um, I'm sure many in the audience know, but there's a lot of firms we're talking to that may not be exposed yet. Um, ABPM is the Association of Briefing Program Managers. I've learned so much from that community. Um, their kind of premier conference is the fall session, which are coming up uh, in just a few days here in April. Um, so that's going to be from the 19th to the 22nd, I believe. Um, I will be talking really just kind of facilitating my good friend Tom Sullivan at PCC to, to use their amazing case study uh, at their corporate ex experience center and the program within it. Um, we're going to dig into some of these broadcast themes that we talked about today and, and some of the very unique ways that this young and very aggressive program is operating inside of their, uh, their fast growing business. So um, hope you can join us there. And panelists, thank you so much. You guys are absolute uh, experts. Uh, I really appreciate all your insights and taking the time out of your day to, to kind of chat with us and wrap. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you to the audience. Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and say it now. Up level at, at your own risk, if we want to say it, uh, is going to come back in person at some level this year. Um, we'll give you plenty of time and plenty of notice. I want to see all of your smiling faces there. Can't wait. So but we'll keep the, the conversation going virtually in the meantime. This has been great. Thanks great. all. Marshall, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks Marshall. Thanks Signet. Thanks guys. This has been fun. Bye, guys.